I'm Adam and this is Amy. We're with the youth media team and we're talking to the Minister for Education and Skills, Jan O'Sullivan. Thanks for taking the time to talk Thanks to us. Much, Adam. Thank you, Amy. Does the student voice have a place in shaping the education policy? Absolutely. Student voice is probably the most important voice. Um, obviously, there are other voices. Uh, we call them all partners in education, but um, we consult with the partners in education about any kind of changes or proposals, and the student voice is always one of the most central voices in all of that. Uh, for example, the student... Um, the national student representatives meet with me and uh, school students uh, and uh, we discuss various changes when they're happening and uh, so that voice is absolutely central. How do you keep in touch with student opinion? Well, partly by meeting with the school students' union, uh, partly by, I suppose, following uh, what the voice of students uh, is saying in media and various places, um, but ensuring that the door is always open and that there is consultation. Because if, we, if the changes we make, for example, in something like Junior Cycle, if they don't work for students, then there's no point in making this change, the changes. So it's really important that we hear the voice. OK. Um do you think that technology is used appropriately in our classrooms and uh, maybe you can make reference to the OECD report uh, where it uh, centralizes the digital learning resources as a systematic innovation? I think it works well in, in some elements of education, not so well in others. Um, it's relatively new, I suppose, uh, in terms of how um, it actually operates within the classroom and within the learning environment. So um, I think we do need to ensure that we constantly respond to change, that we constantly allow teachers to upskill themselves because um, I suppose in some ways the students that they teach may be actually ahead of them in terms of um, access to technology, in terms of use of technology, in terms of being comfortable with technology. So um, we have to see it as um, very much part of the world in which students live, but also um, not a be-all and end-all in itself, but actually a way of, of communicating, a way of learning, a way of um, receiving information. But I think the most crucial thing is that uh, students know how to use the technology, but also that they develop uh, the, the skills, the thinking skills, to actually be able to use the technology well. Um, how do we bridge the gap between the technical knowledge of students versus teachers? Yeah, well, I think one of the ways is um, by teachers having the opportunity to upskill. Um, I think if a teacher is afraid of the technology or feels that they don't have the competence, then they're not going to um, they're not going to use it effectively. So um, I think in some ways, um, it, teachers, if they're confident in themselves, they should see it as um, learning together, if you like, the teacher is learning as well as the students learning. And um, but I think that um, it does provide a real opportunity to uh, to engage with the world as it is the world as the young people experience it, and it should be a uh, part of the classroom in that in in that context. Mm, okay. How can teachers be supported to keep on top of ever changing technologies? Um, I think we need to recognise, first of all, that there is a lot of pressure on teachers that they have to deal with uh, constantly, I suppose, evolving uh, curriculum and, and, you know, changes that we make in terms of policy and so on. Um, so we have to recognise that, uh, that it is difficult to constantly be aware of what's changing. So we have to provide them with um, the kind of training that's available with as much information as possible. And with opportunities like Failcher, for example, gives to learn from each other, to come together, uh, to be given information around what's, uh, what's available to them and to be able to collaborate. And uh, I, one of the things that I would like to see in terms of how teachers work is that they get the chance to be not just on their own in a classroom with students, but that they see themselves as part of a team in the school working and learning together. So I think we have to give teachers all of those opportunities if they are to be as effective as they can be in the, the very important job that they do. And in the future, would you think that it should be made mandatory that teachers should be you know, capable with the technologies that are in the room? 
Well, I think teachers are willing to engage. Um, I suppose when you say something is mandatory, sometimes it makes people feel that they're being forced into something that they don't want to do. I think it's probably more effective to actually provide them with the opportunity um, to encourage them and to let them uh, see uh, that you know this is something that's going to be positive for their own lives. So I'd prefer to use the the uh, facilitating and encouraging and uh, giving opportunity rather than actually saying you absolutely have to do this and you have to do it in a particular place at a particular time. Okay. And um, how do we address the um, shortcomings with infrastructure in schools, for example, poor broadband? Yeah, well, that's something that um, we have just agreed in the capital programme that there will be 210 million euros over the life of the capital plan, which is the next six years, to specifically address shortcomings with regard to access to high speed broadband in schools and also to upgrade the IT facilities and the IT equipment that, that is in schools because a lot of it is out of date. Some schools have, you know, really good high-speed broadband, others don't. So um, the government as a whole is rolling out high-speed broadband around the country through the Department of Communications. But in my department in education, our commitment is to ensuring that that is brought into schools, that uh, then the equipment is upgraded as well. So um, it's a matter of committing the funding that's needed. And I suppose now that the economy is improving, we've been able to make that commitment of 210 million euros for that purpose. Okay, that's all our questions. Thanks very much for speaking to us today. Thanks very much. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Amy.